Oh. Okay. Um, I should just uh, share my screen and start then. Is that correct? Uh, let's see. Where's the chat here? Um, let's see. Is there? Is there? Can somebody tell me if my screen is being seen? You are screen sharing. Well, I guess I will, uh, I will proceed. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation. And I wish I could be there uh, with you at the moment, I guess, although I guess it's not with you doesn't really have much meaning in a distributed seminar like this. Um, so my talk today will uh, really review how what we consider uh, best practices have changed over time. Um, let me, is there any way? Um, okay, let's see if, uh, and I want to. I want to go back quite a ways, uh, back to the 19th century when. The question of overfishing uh, of uh, was first really raised, and uh, and Thomas Huxley, who was uh, best known as an ardent supporter of Darwin and the theory of evolution, uh, expressed skepticism that uh, industrial fisheries were really capable of having uh, an impact on the major sea fisheries. So, uh, this is a a quote of his that says the cod fishery, the herring fishery, the pilchard fishery, the mackerel fishery, and probably all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say, nothing we do seriously affects the number of fish. And any attempt to regulate these fisheries seems consequentially to be useless. Now, in contrast, one of his uh, contemporaries, uh, Ray Lancaster, uh, was, uh, was quite skeptical. He said, it's a mistake to suppose that the whole ocean is practically one vast storehouse and that the place of the fish removed on a particular fishing ground is taken up, uh, taken by some of the grand total of fish, which are so numerous in comparison to man's depredations as to make his operations in this respect insignificant. So there was a lot of uh, contention about whether we really needed to worry about taking too many fish from the ocean. Uh, that issue was resolved during World War I when most of the North Sea was mined and wasn't fished. And by the end of the war, there were many, many more large fish. This is just a graph showing the, the, the landings per day of large fish went from being maybe 50 pounds or 50, uh, hundreds of, of 50, 50 pounds a day to 450 pounds a day in the, uh, in the six years uh, of, of World War I or six years had, had passed. Um, and so it was just very clear that fishing had an effect on the abundance of fish. And in that period, in the first half of the, 19th, of the 20th century, we really began to see the development of fisheries management. The uh, International Council for the Exploration of the Seas was uh, founded in 1902, uh, largely as a research organization, but uh, um, it, it was motivated by concerns about the impact of fishing uh, on the marine environment. And then the, uh, the first true fisheries management commission that, uh, that uh, well, that I'm familiar with, and there may well be others, was the International Pacific Halibut Commission, 
uh, which is a joint commission between the US and Canada to uh, manage their shared halibut resource. And it was formed in 1923, largely at the instigation of uh, the, the fishing industry, which uh, was felt that the, they, had, they had fished too much and the populations had been too depleted. From the 1920s through the 1950s, fishery science as we know it really developed. And the 1950s saw the publication of these two major books, the Dynamics of Exploited Populations, Fish Populations by Ray Beverton and Sidney Holt, and Computation and Interpretation of Biological Statistics of Fish Populations by Bill Ricker. And they really laid out the science of how you can manage fish and, uh, and determine the stock status, sustainable yields, and really the, the basics of what we now consider fisheries management. But despite the fact that we really had a science, uh, the management was really not sufficient to keep some major fisheries collapses from happening. Uh, and uh, so, the Peruvian anchoveta, a uh, fishery that really uh, collapsed dramatically in 1969, 1970, uh, the North Sea herring, which collapsed in the 1960s, and the California sardine fishery, which, which declined and collapsed from uh, the late 1940s to about 1960. So uh, there was certainly a perception that there was a need for more uh, and intense fisheries management to protect the productive potential of the target species. Uh, and so, so uh, in, that, in that era, we started to see uh, very significant develops in fishing policy, largely centered on protecting the productivity of the target species. Uh, the <clears throat> UN Convention on Law of the Sea ratified in 1982, uh, was a very important event, um, led to the declaration of 200 mile zones for most coastal states. Uh, and then we saw in various places, uh, national or international legislation, the U European Union's common fisheries policy, and in the United States, the Magnuson-Stevens Act of 1976. Um, all of those started to really put some uh, structure both in the science, the management and the enforcement. Uh, but again, the dominant focus was on the target species. Things really changed in uh, 1992 with the collapse of the Canadian cod stock. This was a, a fishery that had been sustained for hundreds of years. Uh, it was a fishery that had been touted as a prime example of modern fishery science. And it totally collapsed in the early 1990s. Uh, and it sent shockwaves throughout the fisheries uh, community, both the fishing industry, fishery science, and fisheries management. And one of the responses was an enormous amount of money being poured into marine conservation by a combination of primarily American foundations and uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, and in the 1990s, we saw the formation of the Marine Stewardship Council, the uh, conservation group Oceana, uh, Pew Foundation's marine conservation programs. And from the late 1990s to the early uh, 2010s, uh, those organizations were spending about $300 million a year on marine conservation. Uh, and a lot of it was lobbying for uh, change in fisheries management. A lot of it was funding um, uh, research on the status of fisheries. Uh, initially, much of the money was targeted to the US. This is a graph that was put together for a report done in 2012, uh, where th those uh, organizations were spending something like $90 million a year 
just targeted towards American fisheries, but the total adds up to on the order of $300 million a year. And you saw essentially a large cadre of people whose objective was conservation of marine resources. Some of it directed towards sustaining fisheries, some of it directed towards trying to stop fisheries as much as possible. And this really led to an era that I like to call the doom and gloom era. Uh, and it was highlighted by a paper that appeared in Science Magazine in 2006 that said that if current trends continue, all fish stocks will be gone by 2048. Uh, this uh, scientific article uh, was covered on the front page of the New York Times the front page of almost made every major American newspaper. It was covered on the British uh, BBC Evening News, and it led to a general, as I say, a, a perception of gloom and doom. We saw articles like this in National Geographic uh, magazine, Seafood May Be Gone by 2048, uh, Oceans of Nothing, all of this being generated by that one, one scientific paper. Um, but that, and it's, it's, it's really been shown that that paper was fundamentally wrong, but that really hasn't changed a lot of the, uh, the, the anti-fishing lobbyists. Um, so this is an article from a year or two ago, uh, stop eating fish. It's the only way to save life in the seas. Um, there's a group that has the world day to end fishing, um, and so this isn't, these are not people who want to restrict fisheries to, to be sustainable. These are people who want to get rid of all fishing and make no mistake, there's a lot of people uh, behind this movement. Um, we also see the move towards plant-based foods. Uh, all of it almost always justified by starting off and saying, fisheries are not sustainable. They're being overexploited. The oceans are being emptied of food of fish. Um, so <clears throat> at the same time, since the 1990s, we've seen enormous changes in fisheries policy. Uh, so for instance, in the United States, the Magnuson-Stevens Act was dramatically revised uh, to mandate management to uh, maximum sustainable yield targets and mandatory, rather draconian rebuilding plans when stocks ended up being classified as overfished. Uh, in the international arena, we saw the FAO uh, push the straddling stocks agreement uh, to help uh, resolve issues about stocks that were caught by more one national ge ge geographic jurisdiction. Uh, the European uh, co community, uh, again, revised its common fisheries policy in 2002 to get more teeth in it to stop overfishing. And the FAO uh, uh, succeeded in getting the port states measures adopted in 2016, primarily with a target towards illegal uh, eliminating and reducing illegal fishing. So there have been a number of changes in the practice of fisheries management. Probably the biggest one is we now generally accept that well-managed fisheries have to have reference points, typically reference points around maintaining maximum sustainable yield. And uh, it has now gotten to be standard practice when describing the stock of a, of a the status of a fish stock to this, uh, do this kind of a graphic that's called a, a Kobe plot, where the x-axis is the stock biomass in relation to the level that would produce maximum sustainable yield, the y-axis, the amount of fishing pressure, uh, so that the where these two uh, vertical and horizontal lines uh, intersect would be your maximum sustainable yield target. Um, and this just shows uh, um, several hundred fish stocks uh, in, in terms of what their, their status is. And we see some that are at high abundance, low fishing pressure. We see some that are low abundance, high fishing pressure. I'll talk about that a bit more. So let me just talk about the current issues in terms of maintaining marine fisheries. The first 
and one that is the most important in terms of maintaining food production is the status of the stocks. Are the stocks overfished, uh, et cetera. Um, but then and, and they, they, there is an increasing interest in the environmental impacts of fishing. Uh, in, in the benthic impacts of bottom contact gear, like bottom trawling, uh, in uh, impacts on bycatch non-target species, particularly rare and endangered species such as turtles, albatross, uh, some marine mammals, and then a, ge a general concern from the, the, the rather numerous marine conservation community on ecosystem structure and function. And in more recent years, uh, we see expanded concerns, one uh, certainly around human rights, um, another about uh, a range of impacts of fishing beyond the marine ecosystem, in particular a growing interest in carbon footprint, and also a lot of concern about traceability, much of this because of concern about illegal fishing, but uh, um, there is, there is a lot of international pressure now to make uh, the trade in fish much more traceable. So how are we doing with respect to those, uh, those issues? We know a lot about the status of fish stocks in much of the world. Uh, this is a map that shows the reported catch to FAO by country and the size of the circle is the amount of catch they're reporting. And what is shown in green is the proportion of that catch that is, uh, under, is, is scientifically assessed. So we understand the status of those stocks. And that adds up to roughly a half of the world's fish catch. Obviously the place uh, we don't have very, uh, we don't have much scientific assessment is South and Southeast Asia where you see big circles and no green, whereas, Europe, North America, South America, Japan, um, and a few other countries such as South Africa and New Zealand, uh, we, we know a lot about the status of their fisheries. So what is that status? Uh, and this is a graph that shows the trend in the fraction harvested in orange and in the abundance in blue going from 1970 to 2020. We see that the abundance of fish uh, was declining through that period till about 2000 when it leveled off and then began to increase. We see the fraction harvested increasing from 1970 to about 2000, then leveling off and starting to decline. So this is only for the stocks where we know their status. And as I say, that's about half of the world's fisheries. And the picture there is reasonably comforting that on average, fish stocks are now increasing. Fishing pressure is not excessive. It's well below the level that would produce maximum sustained yield. And in fact, perhaps we should be concerned that we're not fishing these stocks hard enough anymore. Uh, but uh, we don't know what's going on in those very large fisheries in South and Southeast Asia, although we are pretty confident that fishing pressure is very high, uh, starting to come down in, in some places. Um, but what about environmental impacts? Now, this is a big deal in two Latin American countries, Costa Rica and uh, Chile, they have basically made attempts to stop all trawl fishing. Uh, and Chile has banned trawl fishing at about 98% of its economic zone. Uh, uh, Costa Rica has gone back and forth because, not because of concern about the target fish and actually not because of concern about uh, rare and endangered species, but just ecosystem concerns. Um, and a, a large group of, of international scientists has been working on this issue for a long time. This is their most recent paper. Uh, I'm a part of this group. Um, and, uh, and what we've been able to show is again, in places where we have data, and in this case, it includes uh, Alaska and the US West Coast, um, European Atlantic fisheries, uh, uh, South Africa and Namibia, uh, New Zealand Austra and Australia, 
uh, we can show that trawl fishing has had almost no impact on the species on the bottom of the ocean, that they are at anywhere from 90 to 100 percent of the abundance they would be at in the absence of trawl fishing. Um, so that's sort of, that's good news. Um, what about carbon footprint? This is from uh, uh, some work that I and a group of my colleagues did, looking at the carbon footprint of different kinds of animal source food. So uh, in red, you see aquaculture. In yellow, you see livestock, beef, chicken, pork. In blue, you see capture fisheries. And what's plotted is the carbon footprint or carbon dioxide equivalents per 40 grams of protein. So that's normally a, a typical uh, amount of protein in a, in a dinner. And what you see is there's enormous differences that uh, catfish farming in China uh, and beef produce eight or nine kilograms of CO2 per, uh, per, per 40 grams of protein. Whereas shellfish culture, small pelagic fisheries, uh, whitefish fisheries, produce maybe uh, 200 to 300 to 500 grams of carbon. So maybe as, as, as much as 100 times less, uh, certainly as much as 10 times less. Um, uh, and, and many capture fisheries uh, have much, much lower carbon footprint than livestock, for instance. And uh, shellfish farming and salmon farming have relatively low carbon footprints compared to other forms of producing animal source proteins. Um, so uh, in terms of current best practice, some current practices are really uh, pretty well defined that, uh, and I mean, many of this would be what you would find in Marine St Stewardship Council's uh, scoring criteria, uh, but uh, we now expect stocks to be maintained in a healthy condition with an effective harvest control rule. Um, and uh, as I say, harvest control rules now become pretty well required within the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, I think there would be general agreement in the fisheries management community that if you don't have a harvest control rule, uh, your, your fishery isn't uh, likely to be as sustainable as if it had one. Uh, it is now expected to, for concerns about bycatch uh, and, 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 and discarding that there is at sea monitoring, both of where boats are fishing and uh, bycatch, uh, either from observers or cameras and, and trackers. And uh, I think any well managed fishery should have a very high degree of coverage by either at sea observers or cameras and, uh, and fishing locations. Uh, are, are, should be uh, should be, should be uh, publicly available, and in fact, they largely are. There really is no hiding from uh, satellites these days, and uh, between uh, AIS systems, radar systems, and optical cameras, uh, fishing boats can be located and tracked. Uh, now, there's elements of best practice that are are still not really uh, well defined that is, I'd, I, I'd like to refer to them as vague because there are not well defined targets for these things. Um, and uh, uh, one of them is a well managed fishery will minimize bottom impact, but what that minimization is, is not particularly uh, agreed upon. Um, Again, we agree, it's agreed upon that we should minimize impacts on non-target species and ecosystems, but it isn't really, uh, there's no hard uh, targets as to what those limits are. Uh, and there's increased concern about humans' rights. Uh, certainly, I think it's agreed there should be no slave labor, but working conditions in general have risen to uh, a pretty high profile. Um, there are new things that are really uh, just no targets at all, uh, starting to agree that we should have life cycle assessments of greenhouse gas, nutrient, water use, et cetera. Um, traceability, there's increasing demand for traceability. And there's now growing, um, growing uh, noise about fish welfare, uh, both in aquaculture and in capture fisheries. 
So I just want to close by saying there's some really good news that capture fisheries in aquaculture can produce highly nutritious food at much lower impact, environmental impact than alternative land-based production. And whenever I want to think uh, good things about fisheries, I look at the alternative, which is farming. And have, I'll say my son is a farmer and I know what farms do to natural ecosystems. But the public does not trust the fishing industry. Partially, this is stimulated by vested financial interest in the part of anti-fishing NGOs. And part of it is because fishing operations say, unlike farming, disappear completely out of sight, or take place out of sight. Uh, and the solution to this is good science, building bridges with NGOs that want to work with the fishing industry and increasing the level of transparency, again, both in capture fisheries and in aquaculture. Um, I hope that all of you know about our website, sustainablefisheriesuw.org, that has, uh, is, uh, much of the content is available in Spanish. Um, and finally, if you want any more information, I encourage you to read the book that my wife and I produced uh, with, uh, by Oxford University Press, Ocean Recovery, that deals with most of the issues of the management of marine fisheries. So thank you very much.